Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Today it is time for part 3 of Sean Schick's Life of Napoleon Bonaparte. Last time, after escaping Egypt, Napoleon brought about the downfall of the hapless directory and became first consul, quickly proving that his genius extended beyond the battlefield into the realms of politics and governance, or at least it did during this phase of his life. Napoleon later declared himself emperor, a move which, Sean Chick argues, sowed the seeds of his eventual decline and failure. While serving as first consul and emperor, Napoleon reforged the already formidable French army into Europe's premier fighting force. With the weight of the French people and the imperial army behind him, Napoleon was about to reach his apogee and impose his will on the entire continent of Europe. The Son of Austerlitz Napoleon incessantly trained his army for the long-awaited invasion of Britain. Not since William of Orange in 1689 had a foreign army invaded British soil, but if anyone could do it, it was Napoleon. His force was large and superbly trained and led, and arguably the greatest single army ever assembled in the era of horse and musket. By contrast, his navy was outnumbered by the British, and while French ships were well designed, British sailors and leadership were at their peak. Still, Napoleon's chances were fair, and the operation he planned might have worked. Indeed, the most difficult part of the naval operation, baiting the British fleet, had been entrusted to Latouche Treville. He was France's best admiral, and he had even defeated Horatio Nelson. Then, Treville died, and his replacement was the incompetent Pierre Charles Villeneuve. As 1805 wore on, Napoleon became less convinced that an invasion could be pulled off. The British had used subsidies to create a new alliance against France. By the summer of 1805, Sweden, Russia, and Austria had declared war, with Austria having invaded Bavaria and Italy. So Napoleon had to turn away from Britain and deal with Austria. He decided not to enter Italy, where the main Austrian army was, but instead march through southern Germany and destroy their secondary army. Such a move angered Prussia and might have drawn them into the war. It also had to be carried out in the cold rain, which lowered morale and slowed down the advance. Still, the Austrians were in disarray. Their commander, Mack von Lieberich, was unbalanced due to a head wound. He bickered with his officers and failed to march out of Napoleon's way. He might have cut Napoleon's rear, but at Gunsberg he was turned back. At Haslick, his army suffered a humiliating defeat, despite outnumbering Pierre Dupont's division 5-1. to one. Mack's last breakout attempt at El Schengen ended in disaster. By this time, he had lost some 12,000 men. Although around 20,000 cavalry escaped, they were sliced up by Murat's horsemen. Mack wanted to fight, but his officers forced him to surrender nearly 30,000 men, 18 generals, 65 guns, and 40 standards. He offered Napoleon his sword and called himself the unfortunate General Mack. Bonaparte told him, I give back to the unfortunate general his sword and his freedom, along with my regards to give to his emperor. When Mack reported to the Austrian court, he was thrown in jail and never called upon again. Ulm was a victory not of Napoleon's design, but a product of his superb army, which could march and fight like no other in Europe. With the fall of Vienna in November, and Massena winning victories in Italy, Austria should have caved. However, everything else seemed to turn against Napoleon. Villeneuve, against Napoleon's wishes, had sought battle and was crushed at Trafalgar. Nelson was dead, but the British fleet reigned supreme. Francis II took the remnants of the Austrian army north to join with the Russians, while Clemens von Metternich tried to lure Prussia into the fray. Ulm would be an empty triumph if Napoleon could not follow it up, so he chased Francis, overextending himself. The Russian commander Mikhail Kutuzov, the Russian general, hoped to lure Napoleon into a trap by retreating into Galicia. From Italy, Charles's army was approaching and could threaten Napoleon's rear. Prussia was at last slowly mobilizing. Without a victory, all would be lost. Napoleon did not despair. Instead, he hatched a scheme, 
He would lure the Russians into a battle by feigning weakness. Napoleon knew that the young Tsar Alexander I despised him and was hungry for military glory. He had accompanied the army, deciding strategy and leaving tactics and maneuvers to Kutuzov. Napoleon, to fake this weakness, asked Napoleon for peace terms, or excuse me, asked Alexander for peace terms. Spurned on by his overconfident staff and court lackeys, Alexander I decided to bring on a battle. At Austerlitz, Napoleon picked the lower ground and weakened his right in order to bait Alexander. It was a risk, since his line of retreat was guarded on the right. Fortunately, the coalition command bickered. Kutuzov had slept during the battle planning and provided little guidance, and there was a general sense of unease as the Austrian and Russian forces deployed in the wet, cold night. In the French camp, brandy was given to the men, and Napoleon, detecting their weariness, walked among them. In the cold, great bonfires were lit. The men held their emperor with shouts, since December 2nd was the anniversary of his coronation. That morning, Napoleon spoke not of battles, but of the theater with Junot. Then, the roar of cannons was heard. The attack on Bonaparte's right had begun, and was successful for a time. Then, Napoleon pressed the center, and the coalition right. Louis Davou, a hard-fighting and strict commander, came up after a forced march, smashing into the coalition's left flank. The coalition withdrew in disorder. Napoleon's victory was complete, his triumph perhaps the greatest of his era. To his army, Napoleon said, Soldiers, I am pleased with you, and then handed out rewards. In France, wild celebrations were held. In Britain, William Pitt the Younger openly sobbed and lost all hope of victory, succumbing to illness, and for a time it seemed Britain would seek peace. French power was at its peak. Napoleon had officially joined Alexander the Great, Hannibal, Caesar and Marlborough in the pantheon of legendary commanders. As the now humbled Alexander I admitted, we are babies in the hands of a giant. Lightning War Napoleon's triumph at Austerlitz was sealed two days later when Austria gave up. Talleyrand saw a chance to win an ally through a lenient peace, but Napoleon was not one to pass up a chance to expand French power and he wanted to reward his allies in Italy and Germany. The Holy Roman Empire was dissolved. Lands were ceded to Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden. Worst of all, Austria had to pay war indemnities and give Venice to the Kingdom of Italy. France's terms were no more harsh than those imposed by Frederick the Great in the War of the Austrian Succession or Britain after the Seven Years' War. Yet, Napoleon wanted to wed peace to political change, which made his peace settlements less acceptable. In Germany and Italy, governments were remade along liberal and Napoleonic lines, and ancient prerogatives were trampled. Napoleon might be an emperor, but to him, war was hardly the sport of kings. He would impose a harsh peace, and he was willing to destroy ancient feudal rights. Napoleon's political ambitions in Germany brought him into direct conflict with Prussia, Napoleon did little to mollify the Prussians, practically daring them to fight. However, once they chose war, his reaction was one of disbelief. Publicly, he was confident of victory, but privately, he feared Prussian military prowess. Fortunately, the Prussians squabbled and made a rather clumsy advance rather than wait for Russian aid. Napoleon assembled his army and marched into the Prussian rear, meeting them at Jena. It was a small crossroads city, best known for its college. There, many leading German artists and thinkers taught and studied. One of them was George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Upon seeing Napoleon, he quipped that he saw world history riding on horseback. The coming days would inspire him and a generation of Germans to recast the way they saw the world. On October 14, 1806, just north of Vienna, Napoleon found and destroyed the Prussian rear guard in a masterful attack. To the north, at Auerstadt, Davu met and defeated the main Prussian army. The twin victories were on par with Kanai, as panicking Prussians were run down by the French cavalry. The ensuing campaign was like none before. French soldiers marched mercilessly north, sweeping up isolated Prussians and smashing their forces wherever they went. 
Austerlitz might have been the greater personal and tactical victory, but this was a campaign unequaled in the age of horse and musket. Although Napoleon rather disingenuously tried to diminish Dabu's victory at Auerstadt, he nonetheless had overseen his greatest campaign. In Prussia, the disaster at Jena was a cause for a crisis and reform. The old system was transformed in the coming years, and Prussia began its long road to German unification. As Hegel recalled, it was the end of history, or at least the end of the old Prussian system. When Napoleon marched into Berlin, it was with the Marseille blaring, a song he actually hated and outlawed in France. Napoleon was a conservative in France, but in Europe he had replaced his former hero Robespierre as the villain of the age, and he played up the legacy of the French Revolution. Napoleon visited Frederick the Great's tomb, then took his personal emblems as war trophies back to Paris. Despite his victories, the war went on, and there was no immediate end in sight. The Prussian remnants withdrew to Poland, where the Russian army remained defiant. Swedish forces bolstered Prussian garrisons along the Baltic Sea. In Naples, a small British army won a victory at Maida, the first major defeat suffered by Napoleon's French Empire. A guerrilla war soon started that took years for the French to win. Most of all, Britain was unyielding. After Austerlitz, some desired peace, but the Tories held sway. Faced by a British blockade and the Royal Navy's harassment of neutral shipping, Napoleon instituted his continental system. He barred trade with Britain and all nations either ruled by or allied to France. The effect on the economies of Europe was ruinous. French industry was improving but could not meet the demand for manufactured goods. Smuggling flourished, and combined with Napoleonic taxation and conscription, Bonaparte's allies began to waver. So long as victory followed victory, Napoleon might keep up his system, but Russia and Britain remained unbowed. Before Jena, Napoleon merely meant to make France appear without equal. Now he sought to make all of Europe into a French sphere. He wanted nothing less than a new Roman Empire. In his mind, Britain, with its oligarchic tendencies, powerful merchant class, and, quote, mercenary army, was a perfect stand-in for Carthage. Frozen Waste and Summer Glory The fall of Berlin did not cause Prussia to submit, because the Russians had come west with an army. Napoleon might have stayed in Berlin and awaited warmer weather, but he instead chose to mount a winter campaign. The strain on his men was incredible, as snow and mud made fast marches difficult. Thankfully, the army was greeted with cheers as they marched into Poland. France was Poland's traditional ally, and many Poles were inspired by both revolutionary and nationalistic ideologies. Most of all, Napoleon had defeated the very nations that had dismembered Poland in the 1790s. It was perhaps only natural that he created the Duchy of Warsaw, a non-autonomous state which he hoped would provide him with troops and supplies. Napoleon's stay in Poland was tumultuous. The winter campaign frayed nerves and even the ever-loyal Lan began to openly criticize him. Talleyrand correctly judged that the Duchy of Warsaw would only make bitter enemies out of Austria, Prussia, and Russia. It was perhaps at this moment that Talleyrand joined the anti-Bonaparte faction, although retaining a healthy respect for Napoleon's prowess. More intimately, Napoleon's marriage was starting to come apart. The long campaign caused him to seek out mistresses. Eleanor de Nul de la Plena was among them a dalliance set up by Caroline. It was essentially a ploy to separate Napoleon from Josephine, and it worked. Plania bore Napoleon a bastard, proving that he was not sterile. Of greater import was his affair with Countess Marie Walewski. She made her move at the behest of Polish patriot and future French marshal Joseph Poniatowski, the affair became lifelong and bore Napoleon a bastard as well. It also made Napoleon even more friendly to Polish interest. The ongoing campaign at first went well for the coalition. The Battle of Potolsk was inconclusive, and Napoleon was forced to march north in pursuit of the Russians. Thousands of troops had to be detained in the great sieges of Strassland, 
Danzig, and Kohlberg, the latter featuring a particularly plucky stand by the Prussians. At Eylau, in the midst of a snowstorm, Napoleon's divided army had to confront the Russians and Prussians. It was the most bloody battle Napoleon had fought up to that point. Both sides blundered, and Napoleon was saved from destruction only when Murat made a desperate cavalry charge. In the end, the Russians quit the field and the Prussians were shattered, but French losses were such that Napoleon's enemies were heartened. Another victory like Eylau would ruin the French army. As Marshal Michel Ney said, What a massacre! And all for nothing! The spring was spent finishing up the various sieges and licking wounds. The Russians managed to win tactical victories in early June at Gutstadt Deppen and Heilsberg, but neither side, neither battle turned the tide, and with Napoleon absent at each, they were of limited propaganda value to the coalition. Napoleon believed that Russian soldiers were unmatched in raw courage, but that their commanders were the worst in Europe. The Russian general, Levin von Benningsen, was talented, but his maneuvers were poor, and he was unpopular with the army. Napoleon only needed to fight a battle to his advantage. The opportunity came on June 14th, when Lann engaged Benningsen at Friedland. Napoleon, sensing a chance at victory, fed his army into the battle. By day's end, he had shattered the Russians. The victory was all the more impressive when regular French troops repelled the vaunted Russian guards. Napoleon had won another brilliant victory. The Top of the Mountain Napoleon lacked the strength to invade Russia, but the victory at Friedland all but convinced Alexander I to seek peace terms. At Tilsit, the two emperors met and settled upon a formal alliance. Napoleon's peace terms were generous because he sought Russian aid and believed that Russia could guarantee the security of his empire in the east. In return for Russian support against Britain and Sweden, Napoleon renounced his alliance with the Ottoman Empire and granted Alexander I the right to take Finland. Although celebrated in France, the alliance stood on a foundation of sand. Alexander I charmed Napoleon, but secretly he still despised him. Russian nobles were hostile to French political ideas, and they desired British goods. More importantly, Napoleon gave the Russians much, but had no way to enforce his will or entice them to be loyal. While peace was secured, Napoleon would find his Russian allies were fickle at best. If he had been too cruel to Austria, he was perhaps too generous with Russia. Prussia was a different matter altogether. Napoleon forced upon them a harsh peace. He was in part driven by anger, since he felt Prussia had brought about a needless war in 1806, and then fought on for too long. Prussia was forced to give up land containing some one million subjects. They had to pay the French off in spite of economic ruin brought about by the war. Worst of all, the proud army was kept at a maximum of 40,000 regulars. All of this was done in spite of the pleading of Talleyrand and the beautiful Queen Louise of Prussia. The peace with Prussia made Napoleon increasingly unpopular in higher circles, both in France and abroad. As for Prussia, the ruinous peace had a special effect on the nation. It caused widespread economic, political, and particularly military reforms, all with the goal of avenging Jena. Although Prussia was too weak to oppose Napoleon in the near future, if Bonaparte's fortunes ever sagged, he could be sure to have a bitter enemy. Tilsit was both the pinnacle of Napoleon's powers and the source of his decline. Napoleon had forged the greatest European empire since the Byzantines. He had won numerous victories on par with the celebrated battles in history. As a consequence, Napoleon's confidence now became arrogance. In a letter to the Minister of the Interior, he said, Peace has been made with the foreigners. Now, I'm going to make war on your offices. This indicated a new way of carrying out policy. Before Tilsit, Napoleon's ministers had some freedom and were encouraged to be honest. Napoleon began to fire such men, leaning on pliable fellows whose main talent was organization. Increasingly, Napoleon became a micromanager, which only tired him out and ensured that some pressing matters were not properly attended to. Relations with Talleyrand worsened. In 
After Napoleon threatened to execute him, Talleyrand said, The emperor is most charming this morning. Talleyrand was then removed after a public thrashing in which Napoleon called him a silk stocking stuffed with shit. His replacement, Jean-Baptiste de Nompere de Champagne, was loyal, but little else. The army, too, started to suffer. The victory at Friedland covered up a marked decline in its efficiency, brought on mostly by the brutal winter campaign. Although still formidable, Napoleon increasingly relied upon foreign troops, mostly from Germany, Italy, and Poland, to make up for his losses. These troops were of uneven quality. The officer corps had proven to be proficient, but the general, generous spoils made many of them greedy, and the strain of near-constant war was starting to eat away at the abilities of several top commanders. Many, including Augereau and Massena, were becoming war-weary, and their skills were waning as they aged. The worst blunder of all was Napoleon's decision to make compliance with the continental system a prerequisite for peace. In the past, Napoleon had rarely sought war, although he prosecuted it with a vengeance. With the Milan Decree, he chose to dictate trade policy to every nation in Europe. French trade goods could not match those of Britain, except in terms of foodstuffs and textiles, which were France's traditional exports. In that sense, the system was a success, as French industry boomed to meet demand, tying Napoleon even further to the bourgeoisie. British exports decreased, and combined with French privateer efforts, Britain's economy slumped. Still, the main effect was a multiplication of enemies and animosities. Most nations carried on robust smuggling operations. Louis Bonaparte, King of Poland, was removed for his opposition to the continental system. Others openly flouted the entire system and were repaid with violence. When Sweden refused, Napoleon supported Russia's 1808 invasion. When Portugal also refused, Napoleon sent Junot with an army to force his will. By 1808, Napoleon knew that Spain was also tacitly allowing trade with Britain. The system made new Napoleonic empire a paranoid empire. The Turning Point the 1807 invasion of Portugal was mostly a success, except that Junot failed to seize the royal family, which fled to Brazil. While this occurred, Napoleon decided to remove Charles IV, the feckless king of Spain. Napoleon's reasons were varied. Charles IV was incompetent, and there was support for greater French involvement in Spain. Napoleon was seen outside of France as a radical reformer. Many Spaniards hoped that greater French influence would transform institutions and improve Spain's military prowess. Mostly, though, Napoleon feared that Spain, without reforms, could not be trusted to remain an ally or aid in the war effort. By putting Joseph on the throne, he would place the nation in his orbit. With this in mind, Napoleon was planning his first full-blown war of aggression. The Portuguese invasion offered a way to stealthily move troops into Spain and station them at key points. At first, the French troops were cheered on as they marched through the countryside. Yet, when the French seized control, they were faced by a general uprising. Conservative nobles and priests filled the vacuum created when the feckless Bourbons gave up the throne. At first, the French had won the day and the uprising in Madrid was brutally suppressed by French and Mamluk cavalry. Thousands were killed across the nation. Many Spaniards, both neutral and sympathetic to France, now turned on the conquerors. Across the country, guerrilla bands formed. These irregulars would harass the French, losing in pitched battles, but sometimes winning skirmishes or tying up troops. Then at Balen, Dupont's corps was forced to surrender. Francisco Javier Castranos, the victorious Spanish general, proclaimed, This army, so superior to ours, has not only been beaten and routed, but has been constrained to lay down its arms and give up its artillery, and has suffered the lowest military degradation, which the French have been hit hereto accustomed to impose upon all the other nations of Europe, and the imperial eagles, the proud insignia of their triumph, have become the trophies of the Spanish army of Andalusia on the fields of Bailen.
the battle made the situation in Spain impossible. Russia, until then an active ally, now became lukewarm. Russian troops in, Pro in Portugal refused to aid the French, while the naval war with Britain in the Baltic Sea slacked off. Then Junot's small army was captured after being defeated at Vimiero by a British army led by Arthur Wellesley. The British army, which for decades had known defeat more than victory, had shown that under a good commander, they could win. The French were pushed almost completely out of Spain, but the Spanish bickered. Instead of a king, local warlords emerged, most of them incompetent and reactionary nobles. Several juntas formed, and fighting broke out among the Spaniards. Some of the more talented commanders, such as Castaños, were undermined by intrigue. Napoleon gathered the cream of his army and crossed the Pyrenees. At every turn he threatened Spaniards with annihilation, apparently to make Joseph seem like a savior by comparison. The campaign showed Napoleon in top form. In a rough and unforgiving countryside, his army marched hard. At Tudela, his forces, including many Polish troops, smashed the Spanish. A victory at Somosierra, which featured a fierce Polish cavalry charge, led to the fall of Madrid in December 1808. The British, who, had ca who failed to capitalize on Vimiero, had to flee for the sea. Having won the day, Napoleon put Joseph on the throne and returned to France. Yet, the war in Spain raged onward. At Saragossa, some 50,000 perished in the bloodiest siege of the Napoleonic Wars. It was the Stalingrad of the era. In March 1809, Nicolas Soule, one of Napoleon's best commanders, invaded Portugal, only to find the Portuguese army had been reorganized by William Beresford and Miguel Forjas. Wellesley, temporarily sidelined after Vimiero by political intrigue, returned and pushed on Madrid. Although victorious at Talavera, the whole venture was ill-conceived and the coalition had to fall back to Lisbon. While the Madrid campaign showed Napoleon his military best, his political and diplomatic acumen were obviously faltering. Britain was reinvigorated. In Russia, anti-French circles were emboldened and in Austria, where Charles had been quietly revamping the army, saber-rattling resumed. The Last Success Although Ulm and Austerlitz had taken much of the swagger out of Austria's war party, they were emboldened by France's Spanish ills. Prussia indicated that it might join the war, and Russia tacitly confirmed that they would not invade Austria. The final impetus came both from English gold and the fear that Austria may not be able to sustain its military. Only booty from the new conquest could fill the broken Austrian treasury. So in 1809, Austria declared war. Her army was in the middle of reforms, and while much better than it had been at Ulm, it was still not ready. Yet even the normally cautious Charles supported war. With Napoleon tied up in Spain, Austrian hopes were high. They invaded Bavaria and would overrun Germany if not stopped. Napoleon, resting at home, rushed to the front. By this time, his marriage with Josephine had collapsed, due both to her infertility and his affairs. Bonaparte did not tell her of the coming campaign, but the Empress found out and forced her way into his carriage. On a cold morning in February, they held each other in a final, tender embrace. Over in Germany, Charles was marching. Berthia had formed an army, a mixed collection of veterans, German allies, and raw recruits, but he was outgeneraled by Charles. Davout's corps was in danger of being destroyed. Napoleon took charge, and in a desperate series of battles and maneuvers, outfought and outmaneuvered Charles. It is a close-run thing, and Napoleon himself was wounded at Ratisbon. In Prussia, a popular revolt nearly forced the kingdom to side with Austria, but Napoleon's victories reinforced Prussian caution. Napoleon seized Vienna after shelling the city. In reaction, Prussia disavowed any intentions of fighting. For a time, victory seemed certain, but Charles did not concede, and Napoleon rashly struck out at him at Aspern Essling. The battle was a bitter struggle, but in the end, the French were forced back. Napoleon had suffered his first great battlefield defeat. 
French reverses in Spain had now been matched by a personal defeat. In addition to the heavy losses, Jean Lanet was mortally wounded. Although their friendship was strained, Napoleon wept. Lanet was a comrade from the early days in Italy, a man who learned the trade of war under Napoleon and became one of the era's best and bravest. Napoleon said with affection, I found him a pygmy and lost a giant. Yet Napoleon was lucky at Aspirin Essling. Charles had not won a decisive victory. His losses had also been heavy, but most of all he found that his subordinates were slow and unwilling to carry out orders. The imperial court feared that Charles might usurp the throne, and thus its support was lukewarm. In the moment of his greatest triumph, Charles demurred. In the six weeks that followed, Napoleon planned his revenge. He was helped by victories in Italy, Dalmatia, and Poland, which allowed him to draw reinforcements from these peripheral theaters. However, in the mountainous Tyrol province, a homegrown rebellion was at first successful and suppressed only through extreme violence. When the French recrossed the Danube and Charles gave them battle. The ensuing battle of Wagram was a vast dance of death, a struggle filled with pitiless charges, blunders, massed artillery barrages, and flank attacks. In the end, the Austrians were forced to retire, but they were not routed. This was not a repeat of Rivoli, Marengo, or Austerlitz. It was a sign that the old days were over. The dashing horseman Antoine LaSalle, a man known for his bravery, drinking, and womanizing, fell dead trying to break the Austrian rear guard. Wagram was the tactical turning point for Napoleon. The campaign showed that Napoleon was still the master of operational maneuver. He also kept his head together in the midst of defeat. He could still win victories. However, the battles themselves were getting larger. His staff was too small for engagements like Wagram, and such battles stretched his own abilities. The French soldier and his allies were still good, but no longer the peerless machine of 1805 to 1808. Napoleon was not unaware of this change. He knew his army was declining, that the Austrians and his opponents were learning, and that men like Lanet were irreplaceable. His reaction was to amass larger armies and simplify his tactics, preferring massed artillery and frontal assaults to the maneuvers of old. He still thought decisive battle was the path to victory, but his battle plans lacked imagination. He increasingly relied on raw numbers, even as his ability to control such numbers diminished. The old Napoleon, the one who first burst upon the scene at Toulon, was now being eclipsed by the Napoleon of Waterloo.